Good evening and welcome to the Bible study here in Ballyclare Evangelical Presbyterian Church. And if you're able to join with us this evening, that's a matter of great joy to us. We trust that you'll know blessing and something of the presence of God as we look together into God's holy word. Let's draw near to him now and seek his face. Let's pray. Our Father, our God in heaven, we Thank you that your mercies are new every morning. We've known more mercies today. Your blessing has been so kind to us. And we're able to say that all I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. We pray that we may know further blessing now as we wait upon you. Come and have dealings with our souls, we pray. Grant, O God, that we may be built up in our most holy faith and that we may know more of what it means to follow, to trust, and to love the Lord Jesus Christ. So be with us to bless us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to read God's word this evening. It's the story of the crossing of the Red Sea. It's in Exodus in chapter 14. Exodus and in chapter 14, let us hear God's word. <clears throat> now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, that they turn and camp before Pihahiroth, between Migdol and the sea, opposite Baal Zephon. You shall camp before it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, They are bewildered by the land. The wilderness has close them in. Then I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them, and I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army, let the Egypt, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. Now it was told the king of Egypt that the people had fled. And the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people, and they said, Why have we done this? that we have let Israel go from serving us. So he made ready his chariot and took his people with him and he took 600 choice chariots and all the chariots of Egypt with captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the children of Israel and the children of Israel went out with boldness. So the Egyptians pursued them, all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army, and overtook them camping by the sea beside uh, Pi Haharoth before Baal Zephon. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would be, have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. And the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward, but lift up your rod. And stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And indeed, uh, and I indeed will harden the hearts of the Egyptians and they shall follow them. So I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army, his chariots and his horsemen. Then the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. When I have gained honor for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. And the angel of the Lord, who went before the camp of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud went from before them and stood behind them. So it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. 
Thus it was a cloud and darkness to the one, and it gave light by night to the other, so that the one did not come near the other all that night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. So the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on the dry ground, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. Now it came to pass in the morning, uh, in the morning watch, that the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud, and he troubled the army of the Egyptians. And he took off their chariot wheels, so that they drove them with difficulty. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from this, from the face of Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians and their chariots and their horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and when the morning appeared, the sea returned to its, to its full depth while the Egyptians were fleeing into it. So the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. Then the waters returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen, and all the army of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. Not so much as one of them remained. But the children of Israel had walked on dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. So the Lord saved Israel that, that day out of the hands of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. So the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. We thank God for the reading of his word. We'll actually draw from uh, the book of Hebrews chapter 11, and at verse 29, by faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. We thank God for his holy word. Let's turn to him then in prayer. Our Father, our God in heaven, we turn to you there this evening as needy, needful people, needing your grace, your help, and your blessing upon our lives again. We thank you that there's no shame in us turning to you and seeking your face and asking your grace in this way. And we thank you that you make clear in your word that there's no sense in which you uh, despise us for calling upon you in this way. We pray, Lord, remember us. And as a heavenly Father, reach out to us and bless us, we pray. We thank you for all that we know in life, the, the many, many blessings. We give you praise and thanksgiving for those. And we ask you, Lord, that you would continue to remember us with blessing. We think especially of our children, those who are older in years, and perhaps they're not even in the, the, the locality of the church anymore, uh, some who are very young. And we pray, Lord, for the children, whatever their status, whatever their situation, that you might in mercy, remember them and have dealings with them. Help us, we pray, as parents and as grandparents and those who are simply here in church, that we may set before them an example that will be good and edifying, one that will glorify our Lord Jesus Christ. And thus, O oh God, that we might uh, play our part in wooing them to the Saviour. Have sailing de dealings with them, we pray, in the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray, Lord, that you would remember us in the busyness of the week and that you would help us now as we uh, sit down and uh, contemplate your word, that we may hear you speak. We pray for those, O oh God, who are not so well, those who find themselves in great trouble and difficulty. Remember them and bless them, we pray. Cause your face to shine upon them, do them good, and remember them with mercy and grace. And as we meet here tonight, Lord, uh, some of our sister congregations will be meeting. Do them good and bless them and remember them. And remember your kingdom, your work to the ends of the earth. And glorify the name of the Savior, the Lord Jesus, we pray. As we ask in his name. Amen. 
Well, we come back then to the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews is being written to a a group, we don't know what size, but a group of Hebrew Christians who had come to saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But they'd met with trouble and difficulty. And understandably, in a sense, they'd drawn back. Their fingers had been burnt, um, as it were, and and they're, they're, they're pulling back from the Christian faith. They're thinking to run back into Judaism again. And the writer book of Hebrews, in this long book, but this wonderfully practical book, is taken with seeking to um, get them going again, to encourage them, to help them, to explain to them um, that all of that Old Testament period, wonderful as it was, with all the picture language that was involved, so vivid and so on, It was but a preparation um, for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it finds its fulfillment in him. Why would they run back to that Old Testament system? That's what they were thinking to do. Why would they do that when they had the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ? And as we come into Hebrews in chapter 11, we've seen the emphasis very much on faith. And the writer of Hebrews has cited a whole series of Old Testament saints of faith. And he's urging these Hebrew Christians to remember those stories. They knew them so well. Would they not draw from those stories? Would they not realize they needed to run their race of faith? And would they not be firm and strong for God? We've seen in recent weeks quite an emphasis on Moses Um, Last week we thought about the Passover, and this week we come to the story of the Red Sea. Three uh, simple little headings there this evening. First of all, the call to simple faith. What do we see in Exodus 14? It's a simple faith. And the call is to a simple faith. The call to steady faith. And that word, because... What we see here is faith, but it's going to waver very quickly. The call to saving faith. And if here we see faith exhibited in trusting God to cross the Red Sea, well, of course, the the great end of faith is salvation in Jesus Christ. Those three headings then, the call to simple faith, the call to steady faith, the call to saving faith. First of all, the call to simple faith. The story of the Red Sea is one of the most well-known of all the stories of Scripture. And over the years, it's been portrayed in films and so on, and in uh, pictures and and, and all of this uh, stuff. But as it's set before us here, it's surely a a most dramatic incident. We've often spoken of the, the danger of reading the stories of Scripture, reading the happenings of Scripture, but becoming, being perhaps so familiar with them that we lose, um, we we fail to grasp the enormity of all that was involved. What we've got here was the most awesome um, drama. And we know that books can be dramatized and uh, when they're translated then into to, to films or, 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 or whatever, um, all sorts of bits and bobs can be um, added in and all sorts of bits can be dropped. Well, we don't need to do any um, adding in or dropping here this evening. So what do we read? We read that the children of Israel have left um, Egypt or they're in the process of leaving uh, Egypt. But as they do that, they find themselves with trouble because the Egyptians have changed their mind They let them go, but now they've changed their mind, and they're coming after them with all that they have. Pharaoh's heart is hardened, and um, here is a very difficult situation. And they're on this piece of land, and they seem to be surrounded. There's nowhere to go. And um, they, they begin to panic. They turn to Moses. They say, they say to him, verse 12, is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? This is something, of course, that would come up many, 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 many times. It's sad and it's tragic. The Lord said to Moses, why do you cry 
to me. Tell the children of Israel to go forward. Moses um, comes out with that very famous uh, statement, of course, stand still and see the salvation of God. But God says to him, why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. Lift your rod and so on. And the sea parts. And it's the most dramatic of situations. You can imagine um, hearts pounding. For evidently, you know, the, the sea was way and above them to the side. And they're marching through the sea. And you can imagine the, the adrenaline rushing. They're human beings, after all. Um, and what an awesome situation this must have been. Now, you may say tonight, well, that's nothing like my situation and that's nothing like my crisis um, and, and, and so on. It's nothing like um, my situation. But the point, of course, of um, drawing from this story, we may never be called to cross the Red Sea, but the, the point is, of course, that this is a, a mighty event. And wonderfully, we're able to draw from what God did then and to know that God is able to help us in whatever our predicament, our situation is. There are other instances, of course, in Scripture. We could think of the three boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel and chapter 3 with that image of Nebuchadnezzar. We could think of Daniel um, facing the prospect of the lion's den. We could talk about Hezekiah and the armies of Assyria, and how God moves in and ki uh, kills 185,000 men in a night. We could think of Joshua and the predicament that they find themselves in, and the sun is caused to move back, and so on. What are we saying? Well, um, God is able to do great things for his children, and we need to trust him in the practicalities of life. These Hebrew Christians needed to trust God in the practicalities of life. And what then are we looking at? How do we explain what happened that day? Well, it was simple faith. That's why the writer of the Hebrews is drawing on what goes on here. It was simple faith. Ask what was it that the people had been um, you know, had, had they been uh, sort of preparing for all of this? Had they been doing swimming lessons and, you know, practicing their front crawl? Did Moses have a new line in inflatable dinghies? We've seen those pictures from the channel in recent days and weeks. Um, well, we know that God is able to use um, means, and there may be a place for learning to swim and so on. It might save our life one day. It's a good thing to to teach children to swim, isn't it? Um, the, these things all, all commendable in many, many ways, but that was not the story here. They passed through on the dry ground. And um, what we have here was simple faith. They really contributed nothing. It was simply believing God. The people simply believed God. We read in verse 31 of uh, Exodus in chapter 14, Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. So the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. Here was simple faith. And what great consolation um, there is for us in that. that. They really contributed nothing outside of the fact that they listened um, ultimately to God. They believed God. They trusted God. And God was there to provide for their every need. There are many tasks um, in life for which we need to grow and advance and so on. Um, but overcoming in this most dramatic situation, this mammoth predicament, it was simply down to simple faith. And what a help to these dear um, Hebrew Christians. It was down to simple faith. Um, perhaps they had fallen into reason. We, we can't possibly go on. Well, the, he, the Hebrew Christians maybe were thinking like that, but the Israelites were thinking like that. They couldn't go on. Would it not be better to go back 
to Egypt. This is a thought they'd have many times over. And we know that the mind faced with difficulties and troubles and um, all, all the rest of it can do all sorts of acrobatics and it come up with, can come up with all sorts of ideas. It's, you know, in, in, in a difficult enough situation, it can persuade itself that black is white. It can reason this and that. And whilst reason is a wonderful gift from God, how careful we always need to be to submit reason to the wording of Holy Scripture. It's God um, who says, and our calling essentially is to take what God says. It's God who's in charge. It's God who knows the end from the beginning. You know, we can be very quick to come up with our own ideas, our own quick wit, our own solutions, and they're based really on the quick wit of men. There can be the sly about them, the subtle about them. There can be the element of cheat about them. And it's not the way of God. There was no cheating here. There was no quick wit here. It wasn't that Moses, you know, quickly develops a boating business. No. It was impossible, humanly speaking. But here is simple faith. You remember, and we did cite this very briefly there on Sunday morning in the context of uh, Peter coming to be conscious of God's holiness, the holiness of the Lord Jesus Christ. But you remember that incident when um, they've gone back to fishing and the Lord Jesus appears and he says, launch out uh, into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answers and says, Master, we've toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. Now, what a, a great thing that was um, to say. It was simple faith. What have we got here? It's simple faith. And I want to make that point. Our call is to simple faith. Simple faith that takes God at his word. And Hebrews 11 demands simple faith. You can, you know, make attempts. And people have, of course, made attempts to explain away the whole business of the Red Sea. They say, well, the water was shallow. And there were lots of reeds and, and, and all the rest of it. Um, and... You know, this was no deep water at all. Well, it drowned the Egyptians. The story that will follow this is the story of um, Jericho. And we know what happened at Jericho. The walls came tumbling down. We've already thought about the story of Noah. In Noah's day, the whole world perished. Every man, woman, and child in the world, bar those eight that were in the boat, perished. Only eight were saved. And when we think of Hebrews 11, of course, it, it enjoins us to take hold on the full story of the creation. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. That's a clear reference to Genesis in chapter 1, let there be light and so on. That they were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. That's the word creation. That's the word bara, isn't it? God created everything from nothing. Now, the world beckons us back and it says, well, you need to trust in the Big Bang or you need to trust in this. And there are many, many ages and the days are long, long days and all this stuff. Well, that's not what the Bible tells us. And we're called to simple faith. Make no mistake, faith is not something airy-fairy to be defined and refined at will. It's not something that has to fit in with the thinking of the world. Faith simply takes God's word seriously. It believes. And that's what these Hebrew Christians were being called to just as the people of Israel were called to cross the Red Sea. The call was to simple faith. But add to that that the call was to steady faith. These dear Hebrew Christians needed to set their trust in what God said. 
They needed to believe God and not their feelings, not their reasonings, their uh, rationalizings. They needed to hold steady in faith. Now, what we have in verse 29 of Hebrews is something very dramatic. It's uh, quite a commendation, really, of Israel's beginning. It was very dramatic. You might think, well, that's what, you know, um, I, I need. That's what these Hebrew Christians needed. They needed the dramatic. Sometimes you get folk and they... Um, have come to faith through their childhood. And there's been nothing really dramatic, but they've come to saving faith, and it's perfectly evident. We have a number of them in church. And it's perfectly evident that they've come to saving faith. There are strong, strong marks of growth and discernment and so on. There's been no um, great pronouncements. There have been no lights. There's been no music. There's been no curtain and so on. Nothing like that. There's been nothing on a par with Paul on the Damascus Road. And yet evidently God has broken into their lives. And God has made them to be children of God. You often think of Daniel. There's no record of Daniel coming to saving faith. Nor the boys Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Did they believe God? They certainly did. They certainly did. They were people who knew their God. They were strong and they did exploits. There was no drama. There was no dramatic there. These Hebrew Christians, they're not being called to the drama and to the dramatic, but they are being called to simple faith, to steady faith, resting on God. They're being called to look back to those Old Testament stories, to look back to what God did, and to embolden faith, to help faith, to strengthen faith, to use the means of grace to build faith up. We need to emphasize that further, because whilst there's this account of a wonderful exercise of faith in um, Hebrews for, uh, in rather Exodus in chapter 14. Um, and that's followed, of course, by the song of Moses, that wonderful song, I will sing to the Lord, for he had triumphed gloriously, the horse and rider thrown into the sea, and so on. What a day that must have been. What rejoicing there must have been on that day. When we come to Exodus in chapter 16, and there's a problem with food, they're mumbling and they're grumbling. When we come to Exodus in chapter 17, and there's a problem with water, they're mumbling and they're grumbling. Give us water that we may drink. And the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why is it you have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? And they're cross and they're angry. They've got thoughts of going back. That's even there in Exodus in chapter 14. Even their simple faith at times was mixed with unbelief. And we know that for at least, you know, some of them, many of them, that mixture of apparent faith and clear unbelief would demonstrate itself in really the rebellion of Numbers in chapter 14, when the spies have been sent out, two have come back positive, um, Jake, uh, Joshua and Caleb, but ten have come back and they're negative. And the people are not for entering the promised land, and they revolt against God, and there's a breach of the covenant. And they'll spend 40 years wandering in the wilderness, and the older generation will die out in the wilderness. You see, along with these words, which are, um, you know, words of very much of commendation, we, we, we do need to see the context, like it or not, of what we've got in, in 1 Corinthians in chapter 10. Because in 1 Corinthians in chapter 10, I'm not going to go through it all this evening, but we do read there um, that very sadly, 
Well, verse 5, with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. And Paul goes on to cite their, their different exhibitions of disbelief. You see, their faith, well, at times there seemed to be some kind of evidence, but at times there was no faith at all. And it was most unsteady. God was not well pleased with them. And, you know, it would seem that things were at times simply not good. The writer of the book of Hebrews, of course, will cite this situation in Hebrews 3 and verse 12. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. What do we read in verse 16? For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? Now, we need to be careful. Moses himself didn't enter the promised land. So we need to be careful how far that we push that. But it's certainly the case that there was a question mark that hung above them. We're called to a simple faith. We're called to a steady faith. The commentator, he puts it like this. He says, some were saved although they suffered his temporal judgment because of their sins. So I'm not writing them all off. But how sad that there was even a question mark above them. God's people are called to a simple faith. They're called to a steady faith, to a developing faith. You and I are to make every effort to add to our faith. You say, well, I don't think that's um, Bible language, Mr. R. Where have, I, where have you got that from? Well, it, it's there, isn't it, in a passage that we've often adduced in um, 2 Peter chapter 1. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith, virtue to virtue, knowledge, and so on. They were to add to their faith. You say, well, how can they possibly do that? Because God had placed in them everything that was needed to advance salvation. Something that he told them um, in the previous two verses. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which we are, which have been given us exceeding great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. The point is that everything was there. They hadn't sort of climbed the mountain and forgotten to take their climbing rope and their bottle of water and their warm clothing. No, everything was packed for them. For them to make progress in the Christian life. We're called to simple faith. We're called to steady faith. But we do have to exert ourselves to steady faith. And part of the lesson here is that the children of Israel, whilst they're recorded as crossing over the Red Sea, we know that there's a subtext here. And actually, they, they failed in many ways. We simply make the point, you see, that the call is to steady faith. The writer book of Hebrews is not looking for some drama, but he is looking for them to exercise faith in a very difficult situation. Faith needs to go on. That's what true saving faith does. And the writer book of Hebrews here is stirring them on. They were flagging if they hadn't already flagged. But surely he's arguing with them. They didn't bear the character of those who had started so well at the Red Sea, yet had done so badly in the desert. Surely not. No, their faith needed to go on. 
true saving faith does. And for that reason, my friend, let's not, you know, play at the Christian life. Let's not deal in the Christian life at half measures. I could fear that that is the situation, um, you know, in the day and age in which we find ourselves. Things have definitely changed. We're not, um, you know, playing at the Christian faith. This is a run, we're called to run, looking unto Jesus. This is a fight. We're to fight the good fight of faith. This is to be embattled, isn't it? I watched just a tiny bit of the boxing on the Olympics. And of course, when you see the, you know, the boxing on the Olympics, they're all um, covered up and so on and protected. And they're, they're probably not going to come to too much damage. But you can remember boxing matches which you watched in the past and there have been 15 rounds and they slogged it out and by the time they get to the last round there's not much left of the boxes well we're called to a fight and it's not going to be some sort of Olympic exhibition um, match we're going to uh, probably have to slog it out to get to the finishing line to finish the bout we're not called to half measures we're called to Fight the fight of faith. Sad to say, the children of Israel often seem to have faltered. Says the commentator, nothing but faith, persevering faith, can enable the Christian to pass safely through all the trials and dangers of the wilderness and give him a sure resting place in Canaan above. Nothing but faith persevering faith can enable the Christian to pass safely through all the trials and dangers of the wilderness and give him a sure resting place in Canaan above. The call is to simple faith. The call was to steady faith. But add that the call was to saving faith. What a fantastic and dramatic day it must have been when the children of Israel crossed the Red Sea. There have been vast sums over the years spent trying to recreate um, that, that whole happening on, on, on film and so on. But um, imagine the day. What a wonderful day it was. God, of course, will hark back to that day in Exodus in chapter 20 when he gives the people of Israel the law. Oh, he gives it to Moses, doesn't he? And God spoke all these words to Moses. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. And it's the preface to God's holy law. We spoke of God's holy law as the model, um, you know, uh, as the text, as it were, for holiness there on Sunday morning. Well, the preface to that is to be reminded what God has done for us. It's not that we're reaching up to God. God has rescued us is the message. God has rescued us. And we're to respond to him. We're to love him who first loved us. But when we think of that wonderful deliverance, it's really nothing in comparison to what it means to be delivered from the darkness and bondage of sin. Something far, far greater. That God the Spirit should intervene in our lives. That God the Son should have laid down his life for us to pay the price in order that we might be forgiven, that we might be reconciled to God. What a wonderful and dramatic day this was. The day when they were delivered from the bondage of Egypt. But how much greater a day to know salvation, to know the Savior, to know the Lord Jesus Christ. What a wonderful day that was. I trust that you've known that day i trust that you know salvation but what a wonderful day that was and these hebrew christians they had something greater something more wonderful 
You might look back into the, some of those Old Testament stories, I'm sure we often do, and we think, oh, to have been there, oh, to have uh, been there on that occasion, or, or when the, the Savior fed the 5,000, or when he called Lazarus from the grave, oh, to have been there, you might say. Be something far and away greater than all of that stuff in that we've been rescued from sin. We've been delivered from the, the power of the evil one. We've been reconciled to the heavenly father. And we're called to exercise faith. We're called to trust God. There must be faith says the writer of the book of Hebrews. That's the difference between Israel and Egypt. There must be faith, resting in God, taking God at his word, trusting him for his salvation, to rest in the rescue that he has provided. And at the end of the day, you know, wonderful as these Old Testament stories, the New Testament stories of what the Lord Jesus Christ did and so on, wonderful as they are and were, they're precursors to what would be accomplished for us there on the cross. What a wonderful thing we have in salvation. What a wonderful Savior. And how careful you Hebrew Christians and how careful we are to be in running the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus. This saving faith, this being entrusted to Jesus, is the difference between eternal life and eternal death. Do you have this simple saving faith? Is that where you are tonight? Resting and trusting in the Savior. Nothing to bring nothing to contribute. You've been brought to a sense and knowledge of your sin and guilt. You've come, as we said there on Sunday morning before that, holy God, that absolutely holy God. Woe is me, for I am undone. You have nothing in your hand to bring, but you're resting and trusting in the Savior. What a wonderful blessing that is and how careful to exercise that simple faith and how careful then to to go on not to be content just as it were with simple faith but to exercise that faith to make progress in the christian life to be steady in the christian life and ever to be found looking unto jesus we'll turn to god and we'll pray our Father, our God in heaven, thank you for your holy word. Thank you for the wonderful reminder of what happened on that day when you led your people Israel across on dry ground and into safety away from the people of Egypt. Lord, we thank you for that greater story of how through our Lord Jesus Christ you led us from our sin and death, our corruption, and from the power of the evil one and to in a into a place of reconciliation with God. Help us day by day, we pray, to, to trust you for all that you say in your word, to trust you, Heavenly Father, in life's many difficult situations, to trust you, conscious that we ever need the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.